Americans are justifiably, understandably fearful of losing their jobs, of having their wages cut, of having their hours cut, in some instances, losing access to health care, sometimes to a health plan upon which they and their families have relied for many years. This is a difficult situation for them because health care is an especially unusually personal thing. Access to health care is something that people don't necessarily want to entrust entirely, entirely to their government. And yet, that seems to be the direction in which Obamacare inevitably takes us. It puts more and more of our health care into the control of the federal government. And as has been suggested on the floor tonight, as some of my colleagues, some of my Democratic colleagues from within the Senate have acknowledged, this is but a step in the direction of what they hope will be a single-payer, government-funded, government-run health care system, funded, operated, administered entirely from Washington, D.C. Now, there are some things that government can do in the sense that there are some things that government is rather uniquely empowered to do, providing, for example, for our national defense. And that's something that we do from Washington. That's a power that's entrusted to us by Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. With roughly one-third of the provisions of Article I, Section 8 being dedicated in one way or another to our national defense. That's something that Washington can do. It's something that Washington must do and that Washington is rather uniquely empowered to do under our constitutional system. Healthcare is, of course, important, undeniably important. In many respects, it's as important as national defense. The fact that it's important doesn't necessarily make it a responsibility of the federal government, nor does it necessarily qualify the federal government as a practical matter, setting aside the constitutional question. It doesn't necessarily qualify the federal government as an effective health care provider. Many people fear the day when our federal government becomes much more empowered over the very personal decisions of our lives, particularly those affecting our access to health care. Many people are also suspect of the new taxes imposed by this law, the new permutations that this law will introduce into the lives of the American people. We've discussed several times today the manner in which uh, this law was enacted, the manner in which it was introduced as a bill brought to the floor of the House of Representatives after then Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, informed her members that they needed to pass the bill and then they could find out what's in it. One of the things that we have not discussed as much is the f fact that even after that was passed, without members of Congress having adequate opportunity to review this legislation, even after that happened, and setting aside the 20,000 pages of regulations that have been added to this corpus of federal law up until this point, we've had two significant revisions of the law, revisions that were brought about not legislatively, but by the judicial branch of government. Revisions that the judicial branch of government had no authority to impose. I'd like to talk to you about both of those. When the Affordable Care Act was challenged as to its constitutionality, there were two primary constitutional challenges brought to the attention of the federal court system that ultimately made their way to the Supreme Court of the United States. One of those challenges involved a constitutional attack on Congress's authority to enact the individual mandate. The provision compelling individuals to buy health insurance, not just any health insurance, but that federal, that, that kind of health insurance that the federal government in its infinite wisdom deemed appropriate and necessary and essential, indispensable to every American everywhere. 
The argument presented in those constitutional challenges, culminating at the Supreme Court of the United States, was that Congress had, enact, had acted pursuant to its authority under the Commerce Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 of the Constitution, which empowers Congress to regulate commerce among the several states, with the Indian tribes and with foreign nations. The argument said Congress does have power to regulate interstate commerce, and the Supreme Court has interpreted that power rather broadly since 1937. And yet, either, even under that extraordinarily broad interpretation of the Commerce Clause, so the argument went, Congress doesn't have the power to regulate inactivity. The failure to purchase health insurance is not an interstate commercial transaction. In fact, it's not a transaction at all. It's a failure to act. The Supreme Court of the United States accepted that argument and concluded that e even under the extraordinarily broad deferential standard of review used by the Supreme Court since 1937, this could not pass muster as a valid, legitimate exercise of Congress's Commerce Clause authority. The Supreme Court justices rejected that argument by a vote of five to four. Oddly, however, the Supreme Court went on to conclude that the individual mandate was nevertheless constitutional, not under the commerce power, but under Congress's power to tax. In essence, what you had was five justices of the Supreme Court led by the Chief Justice of the United States, the Honorable John Roberts, who, as I see it, effectively rewrote the individual mandate provision as a tax, saved it only by recasting it as a tax or as a valid exercise of Congress's power to impose taxes. There are a couple of problems with that interpretation. First and foremost, Congress could have adopted a tax, could have imposed a tax as an enforcement mechanism to bring about compliance with the individual mandate provision. And yet, it decidedly did not. It used language that under at least a century's worth of jurisprudence was clearly, unequivocally, a penalty and not a tax. You see, there's a long line of cases that helps courts decide whether something is, on the one hand, a penalty or, on the other hand, a tax. And this was, under a century or more worth of jurisprudence, a penalty and not a tax. It's also important to note that the House of Representatives initially considered language that would have attempted to enforce compliance with the individual mandate provision by means of a tax, using language that, under a century's worth of jurisprudence, would have been regarded as a tax. Yet interestingly enough, and not surprisingly, that language was rejected. That proposal did not carry the day. That proposal could not carry the day. Why? Well, because most Americans, understandably, are reluctant to raise taxes on middle-class Americans. It was soundly rejected. It could not carry enough votes. Even in the Congress in place during the first two years of President Obama's administration, a Congress that was overwhelmingly Democratic in both the House of Representatives and in the Senate, it could not carry the day. So the Constitution requires that revenue bills originate in the House of Representatives. If this was a new tax, it would have had to have originated in the House. In a sense, in a very significant sense, one could argue, the bill that ultimately became the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, did originate in the House. It came over here to the Senate. It had its provisions stripped down and replaced by Senate language. But many people still consider that a House bill. The problem here has a lot to do with the fact that the tax language did not originate in the House or in the Senate. It originated instead across the street. It originated instead across the street with five lawyers wearing black robes 
who we call justices. Now, those five lawyers wearing black robes, who we call justices, are no more empowered than the Queen of England to impose a tax on the American people. And yet they imposed a tax on the American people. This is not okay. This is not acceptable. This was a lawless act. This is something that we should be ashamed of as Americans. This was a sad, shameful moment when the Supreme Court of the United States took upon itself the mantle of a super legislative body, which it is not. Unable to bring about a massive tax increase on the middle class, the Congress adopted what it could. What it did adopt, the Supreme Court found to be unconstitutional on its own terms as it was written. The Supreme Court, apparently unwilling to do its job, and all too eager to do the job of the legislative branch, rather than acknowledging the unconstitutionality of that provision, simply resurrected it by rewriting it, by rewriting it as something that it is not, was not, and never could be.